Okay, thank you everyone for being here. Welcome to Virtual Good Talks. Uh, my name is Shannon, for those who I haven't met. So Virtual Good Talks is our monthly series of artist talks with emerging artists who have connections to London that would discuss their careers. And we would like to acknowledge funding and, and give thanks to the Ontario Arts Council, an agency of the government of Ontario who is sponsoring this series of talks. Hey, thanks, Shannon. Um, so yeah, Shannon mentioned that Good, good Talks is a um, series mentioned by Good Sport. Um, we do want to do um, a land acknowledgement. Um, good Sport is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Lunapa, sorry, Lenape, and the uh, Attawandaran people in southwestern Ontario. These lands are connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, Wampum. Our acknowledgement of this place and its peoples is made with deep gratitude and good support stands in solidarity with the land and water defenders of Turtle Island, especially with the Six Nations land defenders located near us um, that are fighting for sovereignty at 1492 Landback Lane. I'm gonna put a couple of links in our chat if anyone wants to uh, look into the GoFundMe um, that is available um, to help those fighting at um, 1492 Land Back Lane. I'll put it in the chat, as well as at LOSA, which is a London-based um, Indigenous centre, um, helping and uh, protecting Indigenous people in our city. And then we will also be introducing um, our Good Talks artist today. So Brianna Toswell is a printmaker and book artist working out of Snap Print Shop in Edmonton. She collaborates with a variety of creatives to elevate their work with detailed illustrations and innovative use of book form. These projects are often centered on themes of mental health, environmentalism, and grief. She also makes really pretty prints of people reading because we all need to take comfort in something. Um, I have nothing else to add, so I'll pass it off to Brianna. Thank you so much. All right, can everyone, can everyone see my little presentation here? I suppose. It's not so much of a, a feedback situation. Okay, yes. Hello, I'm Brianna Toswell, aka Penrose Press. Welcome to my artist talk. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of uh, a backstory and explain my connection to London, Ontario. And um, I'm going to talk about the trajectory of my work as an emerging artist because I feel like I've gone through some pretty significant um, changes, as we all do. And I'm going to put some emphasis on fusing your business brain and your art brain for anybody who's interested. And uh, yeah, I'm going to show you lots of pretty pictures. And if you feel like sticking around at the end, um, I'm going to tr attempt to guide you into the headspace of a lino cut reduction printmaker. Um, questions are welcome all the way through. If you want, you can uh, type them into the chat. The folks at Good Sport are going to monitor that and uh, speak up if there's any questions. You can also um, just unmute yourself, or if you don't want to interrupt, you can just type a question mark into the into the chat, and then we'll call on you like lecture style. Um, I basically feel like asking questions is the best way to <laughs> interact with a talk like this and like demonstrate understanding and critical thinking. I love question askers hit me with your hardest one. Okay, I have never actually lived in London, Ontario. I am currently based in Edmonton, Alberta, and uh, I spent most of my early 20s in Toronto. Um, but I did spend most of my childhood in St. Thomas, Ontario, which is 20 minutes uh, away from London. And I went to, I'm going to say it, the best high school ever, feel. Um, for anybody who's familiar, this is a, a shot of a, a plaque at Beale. It's a uh, ceramic and it's been impressed into with lead type for letterpress. And it's all the things that you're not allowed to make art about, <laughs> uh, which is like a really wonderful jumping off point for a student who is like, you know, doesn't, doesn't have a, a grasp of the art world and, and is trying to think about what, what's worth making art about. Um, I was actually chatting with a friend of mine in the studio here in Edmonton 
and about like our first ever printmaking experiences. And I mentioned I did a litho in high school and she was like, what, what high school did you go to? And I said, oh, you probably haven't heard of it. It's, it's called Beal. She's like, oh, I've heard of it. I went to NASCAD. Everybody at NASCAD knows about Beal. So that's some, that's some countrywide representation there. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, my year at Beale was kind of supposed to be like a gap year. I had like a last minute panic and like cried with my mom about maybe not wanting to be a criminal sound attorney as planned. Um, I was, you know, one of those kids who like really internalized the starving artist myth really early. Um, <laughs> you know, people would ask me, you know, do you want to be an artist when you grow up? And I, at 12, would be like, do you know how impractical that is? Um, so, yeah, I, I had not envisioned myself a life as an artist, um, but we heard about Beale, and I applied, like, last minute, probably late, and um, I, I can't even believe how wonderful the school is. Um, yeah, to be, like, a high school student and have a the equivalent of like a first year university arts program except possibly better and free like it, it was amazing um yeah i came in i feel like i came in to be with like a pretty good eye and an aptitude for technical application and i learned that all art should have an idea behind it which is a concept that never got addressed in my regular high school art classes um I thought art was supposed to be visually clever. I never considered emotions, which if you know me is kind of hilarious. Um, early in my art career, I had a preoccupation with being impressive. I made big art and I made it detailed and representational and set weird limitations on myself. Um, these two and the last drawing that I just showed you were all done with three colors of color pencil, just red, yellow, and blue, which again, impressive but but why why was I doing that I could not tell you uh I spent hours and hours and hours on it the number one response to my work was wow how long did this take you which made me feel good but in hindsight is kind of bland as a response to an artwork that's supposed to make you like feel something um a friend of mine has actually stopped being a printmaker because He's sick of people only wanting to talk about the process in his work instead of like the content of his work, like subject matter and everything. Um, yeah, this trend continued when I went to OPAD. Uh, I did a one year blip of fashion design in between. Um, and at OCAD, I was the litho girl. That print of the birds on the far left is a. <laughs> with a tricolor lithograph. So again, I was still limiting myself to red, yellow, and blue, um, which was fun. And yeah, for uh, two and a half years or so at OCAD, yeah, I was, I was the litho person. I practically camped out on the Griffin Press. And uh, yeah, it was, it was good to be, it was good to be known for something. But somewhere along the way, I discovered Lino Cut and Letterpress. And I was shocked by how easy it was. Uh, I, I hadn't, you know, give me like a difficult thing to execute or a simple thing to execute. And I almost always go for the difficult thing. But I couldn't believe that the lino, you know, never filled in halfway through your edition and your hands could stay clean <laughs> the whole time you were printing. And you didn't feel like you needed to take a nap after printing before you cleaned up. Registration was a dream. Uh, I haven't done litho in five years, but now I'm like the lino girl on the internet. The pool just keeps ex expanding. Uh, thanks to Letterpress and a very um, enthusiastic prof, I found myself dabbling in book art. Uh, ex enthusiastic mentors have been pretty key part of my trajectory. I got into litho because of Jeff Dean. I got into Lino and Letterpress because of George Walker, and I approached my practice like a business because of Jen Aesthetic. I was just looking at these this morning, and I'm laughing at the margins on this. Like, the text is, like, almost all the way to the very edge of the page, which is something I would never do now. But 
it was like my second book ever. So. I took a couple of creative writing electives at OCAD, and I met in one of them, I met my very first collaborator, Joyce Jody Kim. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here because if you've ever encountered Penrose before, you've probably heard this story. Um, she wrote a book, Beale alumni, Natalie Lyth edited it, and I illustrated and printed and bound it into a book. It took us like half a year and a project grant to make it happen, but when we finally launched it, the edition of 100 sold out in two days. I was like, huh, maybe this is my thing. Uh, I, along with Natalie, started to market myself as a micro publisher, Penrose Press. Um, Natalie was my business partner for about three years, but the pandemic theft made it clear that we had different goals, so we parted ways. During the time I thought I was a publisher, I made huge strides professionally. I became very comfortable with planning and executing complex projects, planning launches, etc. I also experienced um, more imposter syndrome than I ever have before. Um, at dinner with my grandparents, I was finally able to say that I was something other than an artist. <laughs> uh, but it felt kind of stranded between art and publishing islands and drowning, uh, all the while telling myself that I was occupying a previously empty niche and it would get easier. I worked on some really cool projects with very talented writers, though. That first book, uh oh, this is a video. Is it going to go? Let's see. The first book, Caterpillar Portraits by Joyce Jody Kim. Has this thing where all of the covers were torn right off and then glued back on again um, because one of the characters in the story repairs library books on the fly and so we kind of wanted to make a physical manifestation of that part of the story in the book. This is a Vandercook letterpress, by the way, for anybody who has never witnessed one before. It is the reason that I am able to be an artist is because of this kind of press and the fact that there are public studios like Open Studio and Snap that have allowed people access, really affordable access to this press, which otherwise would cost me like $10,000. $10,000 I don't have. Let's see. Nope. I want to go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, the Insomniac's Assistant by Sienna Tristan was a story that took place over the course of one night. And I bracketed the text with a dusk city at the front and a dawn city um, at the back. And then also all the illustrations in the middle slowly transitioned, like as you flipped pages from blue to pink, which was a lot of fun. The Pink of the Seams was a poetry book that I printed and bound loose in a handmade envelope. Um, we were trying to encourage an orthodox reading. Like the envelope felt like a quilt, so maybe you would dump it out on your bed and read everything out of order. It was an envelope, so maybe you mailed all 15 poems to different friends, like dividing the book up forever. I try to make readers do things that they are uncomfortable with. <laughs> oh, I think I did another video. Let's see. This is the envelope before it got folded up and it's just, you can see the blind embossing on the page. You can really read the text and then all you can see is texture. Very satisfying project. I actually have, I printed this entire project on warm white paper and then I took and then I made this textured paper by um, printing the same plates just with no ink. And I realized after I had like soaked and ran, you know, like 50 sheets um, through the etching press that I had done it all on white paper and not warm white paper. So I redid it all in warm white paper because otherwise it would have looked horrible. And I still have the white paper beautifully embossed with this gorgeous pattern. And I'm still trying to like think of something beautiful. But I try not to, um, I try not to let the odd bits of projects go to waste. I like to repurpose them into new things. 
Next slide. <laughs> there we go. Uh, if a Carb Dreams of the Milky Way by Jasmine Gooey was the first book where the poet in her first email to us said, hey, I think this needs to be a scroll. Can you make a scroll? And I was like, I've never made a scroll ever in my life, but absolutely. Um, and trying to figure out how to make a scroll was a very interesting experience because no, nobody makes them in North America. And you can't find like an online tutorial in English. So what I did was I went to the Fisher Rare Book Library in Toronto um, and I asked to see all of their scrolls and they had eight. <laughs> they had eight scrolls in the entire library. Um, and so I was able to like, you know, carefully handle them and like examine how they were constructed and what materials they used and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so they had eight and now they have at least nine because they have this one as well, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, also printed on the letterpress, different letterpress than the last video. This is the one it opens to here. And that's lino on the press. So you can print, uh, I often print lead type lino carved illustrations and occasionally polymer plates, which are like a plastic version of lino that you can print from a digital file. Um, so that's cool. But it's kind of expensive and not everyone has the equipment, so you have to order from the States. Yeah, so now I still make books collaboratively, but I refuse to be called a publisher. I am a book artist. It seems like a silly distinction, but it's very important to me. Uh, my most recent project is also maybe the weirdest and most, am most ambitious, but that's kind of my pattern. Um, Conversations with the Ocean by Evelyn Elgy is a long form poem that we made into three illustrated chapbooks that have to be washed in the ocean before you can read them. Uh, it actually doesn't have to be the ocean, any water will do. We brought on collaborators on both coasts and near the Great Lakes to wash the three editions, and there's also a DIY one. So this is the Great Lakes edition in that like greenish color. And this is the Pacific edition. And then there's an Atlantic edition and a collaborative edition. But yeah, it was a big learning curve. <laughs> uh, this brings us almost to the present. For the past year or so, I've been making these super pretty and comfy line of cut prints of readers. Um, I actually learned to draw by drawing readers because, you know, when I was in high school, and trying to draw people, I would ask people to, to pose for me. And a lot, of, a lot of my friends would be like, sure, absolutely, I'll sit still for 20 minutes while you draw me, but um, can, I, can I keep reading my book while you do it? <laughs> uh, which used to be really, really frustrating to me, and now it's like my go-to subject matter, so I think that's kind of amusing. Reading has always been my safe place, my brain sanctuary from overactive thoughts, so while sometimes this work doesn't feel academic enough, like who am I challenging? What important questions am I asking? It brings me and others a lot of comfort. And the other thing about these prints is that they fund the rest of my art practice. Um, selling these prints means that I can keep collaborating on super cool, if not super lucrative book projects and also means that this past month I quit my day job to do art full time, which is a dream I've had since the beginning of Penrose. Um, one of my favorite art textbooks, Art Slash Work, yes, I have a favorite art textbook, <laughs> says that one of, my, one of the most valuable things for a young artist to accept is that virtually all artists have day jobs. I don't disagree with this advice. I think, I also think entry level day jobs are pretty essential for all humans to experience. Um, I have a blog post on penrosepress.ca that actually goes through all of my day jobs in order so you can see what it's like to be one version of an emerging artist. It's still pretty early for me to have any wise conclusions about this. Uh, I was hoping something would come to me, but not yet. Uh, I'm still technically still at my day job until the end of February, uh, but I can't wait to devote all of my time to art and collaboration. That's the end of my structured talk. 
Did anyone have any questions so far? Yes, Zane. Hi. Um, Hi, Zane. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I'm bad at like questions, but I just kind of wanted to like start talking at you about like, because I'm a print maker too. I do um, probably mostly stencil and silk screening now. Yeah. And um, I'm having like last year, like I kind of had like everybody had, you know, a total paradigm shift in their thinking process and everything. And I'm just, I was just kind of like, how do I make money doing printmaking? And like, what is printmaking anymore after digital print? And like, does it even need to exist anymore? And like, oh my gosh, I hear you. Yeah. I... Like, where, <laughs> like, what place does printmaking have in the world? Like now that phones exist and like, none of these things would exist without printmaking, but like now that they exist, like printmaking doesn't have to exist anymore. It's like, it's it's a constant like killing itself and then like reborn like re it's like constantly killing itself and then re like coming out somewhere else and then like yeah. going away and then coming out again like it's it's I don't know if you have anything to add but like <laughs> you've obviously you've obviously like kind of cracked the code there for you like I yeah I think what you just said is so important like I cracked the code for me <laughs> there's like so many different factors that make uh, an art practice financially viable or not and I hear you about like what is this like we have digital printing like why do any of us need to make prints anymore um, I, I can't tell you how discouraging it is to because I'm my job is a custom framer and so I'll find like a Robert Bateman print and it'll be addition to number 605 out of 13,072 or something like it's absolutely absurd like why would you try and make that a limited edition it doesn't make any sense well, there's, um, yeah, there's like sports cards and like mad magazines that are like, there's a million copies and it says like, these are from the nineties or whatever, but it says like, this is issue 13,000 out of 1 million. And it's like, like, ha ha ha. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. Yep. And it's $2. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's interesting, the concept of a limited edition. Like, I don't consider myself, my work super limited because... I do editions of between like 20 and 100. Um, and uh, I know people, like my partner, for example, he's like a good edition size would be like six, um, six prints. And so I don't feel like I'm a limited edition, but then when you compare it on the spectrum. But the cool thing about limited editions is that mass marketers and musicians and people are using limited edition and like limited access products to sell like sneakers and stuff and there's like a huge market for it um and i mean beyond the limited edition thing i, I do honestly believe that a print a lino print or an etching or a screen print has a certain quality physically that separates it from a digital print um you know like the texture of the paper versus the texture of the ink can catch light differently and as a relief printmaker you know the texture is important to me um you know sometimes my prints are you know debossed quite deeply into the print not usually because i'm a book artist and i often work on both sides of the paper um but sometimes and yeah, yeah, it's a tricky thing. One of the things that I like to think about when I'm trying to plan for myself how to do something in a financially viable way is I'll do the math. I'll be like, how, how do I want to execute this? Like, how much, is this a one month project? Is this a five month project? And I think about like the, the budget including like paying people a fair wage and then i break the budget down by you know say the say the budget is ten thousand dollars and now you know that you can sell 10 of them for a thousand dollars or you can sell a hundred of them for a hundred dollars or you can sell a thousand of them for ten dollars and i just like doing that multiplication math and like seeing all the things that end up at the same number and be like okay how many can i do how much do I think I can charge for any one thing? What's the market for this? Um, 
And I talk to people a lot, a lot, a lot. I could keep rambling. Uh, I don't know if you want to like structure my rambling in any other direction. <laughs> um, That's awesome. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I have definitely thought about the same thing that Zane has thought about. I'm not a printmaker, uh, but I have lots of friends who are. Um, and yeah, I mean, what you just said is, is so true. Like there are certain distinctions that I don't think will ever be like fully replicated, um, or at least not in our lifetime. Um, and so there's like a nostalgia involved in like using these things like traditionally, like the same reason why uh, artists still draw physically instead of drawing on a tablet. Like even just the feel of it is different. You can tell the difference between holding a digital pen and a, a real pen or something, so. Also, from my perspective as a framer, like I have encountered digital prints of paintings and prints on canvas of paintings. And I can tell you for a fact that no matter how good your digital printing is, either your original or your like actual like best ink of you know a screen print or what what have you is is going to last ages longer. Um, like I've yet to see like a print on canvas that doesn't peel at the corners and you stretch it. Um, it's not it's not a perfect replacement, and I think people know that. Um, and one of the things that I do as part of my practice, and I don't know if this is in the part where people were listening, but Zane, you were mentioning, um, like trying to get more comfortable with social media. One of the things I do on social media is that I educate people about what it is that I do, so that they can see the value in what I do. Like. You don't go up to a complete stranger and say, hey, this is a lino cut. And they're like, great. I don't know what a lino cut is. It's a prettyish picture, I guess. Um, but by showing people the process, they gain a new appreciation for the thing. So yeah, I think a lot of, especially a lot of printmakers, but a lot of artists in general are also educators. And it's partly, hey, do you want to make art? This is how you do it. And it's partly, hey, this is how I make art please see the value. Yeah, and it's kind of like, uh, I guess the difference between the handmade and the digital is kind of like a, it has some sort of basis in reality rather than just coming out of like a computer. Mm -hmm. so it kind of connects it more to the physical reality rather than like just a, yeah, like a document, I guess. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things, I, I've said this like seven times in the last couple of weeks, but my favorite things about COVID is the return to um, physical mail, I think. Like, like the post office tell us that, you know, they've had so much mail going back and forth um, this year compared to other years. And it's partly because people are just shopping online, but it's partly that we're sending mail to each other. And you know, that return to like a physical letter or uh, a postcard is very much, it's very much like a print centric thing. It's like a, this physically tangible item with my actual handwriting on it that was actually in my presence before it came to your mailbox is something that digital just doesn't have. It's like a, a book compared to an ebook. Books will always, a physical book will always be more romantic to have on your shelf and hold in your hand than an ebook. And I say that as a person who reads a lot of ebooks. Um, or even like the word like uh, watermark, like used for <laughs> shutterstock. And then it's like, it's just like a gray text that's like preventing you from using their photo. But like that word is like so old. <laughs> like not, yep. not what that. Anybody who is <laughs> not familiar with print history and paper history, a watermark is kind of like a seal that is, it's not even impressed into the paper. It like is part of the mold that makes the paper. And so uh, it's a situation where you hold your paper up to the light and the light shines through the watermark because the paper is thinner there. And so fancy papers have, still have these watermarks. Um, and it's not even about it's not even about the art usually it's about the paper manufacturer which is very much adjusted from the digital version of the watermark yeah i'm just trying to like bring it into the you know into the future because it's like that's what we're constantly doing is like mm -hmm. uh, the art the artists take something that you know is 
being pushed aside or not being utilized and then they make it into something else like graffiti coming out of the spray like the aerosol era and like everything being in an aerosol can and then yeah. someone it and like instead of your, instead of spray painting a lawn chair they're spray painting like a portrait and like it's it's kind of like I guess a refusal to let things like die or like let yeah I'm also um I think there's like different categories of printmakers as with anything and there are some printmakers who really want to hold on tr to tradition at all costs and I don't think I'm one of those printmakers like I'm not going to do something a hard way if the easier way has been invented um and I'm not gonna like I have this thing where Okay, especially with reduction line of pets, the one that's on the screen right now, you can see there is some really subtle layer differences. Like, where can I show you? Okay, on the, the figure on the right, on her neck, there's three tones. There's like the light peach tone, the light brown tone, and then like the gray tone. That's the same color as the legs in front. And you can hardly see the difference between that light brown tone and the gray tone in that context. And whenever I am doing something and I'm like, you can't even see the difference between the two layers I just printed. I'm like, that was a waste of labor. And I hate <laughs> wasting labor now. Um, <laughs> it's definitely different from my like teen approach to art where I was like, labor creates value. It does not. That's really interesting. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, you have like maybe just an unused tone. So in Beale, I feel like they kind of sometimes uh, they would like push us to, I went to Beale too, uh, they would sometimes push us to do things that would kind of like add a little bit extra. So maybe that layer is like a waste of time in the commercial sense. But then if you, you know, like if you took this into Photoshop and like digitally removed that color, like it would, it would take something out of it. So I, b I believe that 100%. Um, I also think that, I don't know, I feel like it's an exercise in art classes where they're like, try and create 45 different shades of gray. And I'm like, okay, but the human eye can basically process seven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> or like Shepard Fairey, who the, you know, printmaker who does pretty much just red and black or like dark blue, red and black. And like, mm -hmm. you, like you can like, pretty much tell everything you need to do in just black or white and like and then adding another color just adds a little bit of like pizzazz <laughs> so it's like <laughs> so, <laughs> everything else is like I, I right now I'm just stuck in black and white but like because I, I every time I'm like well I don't need anything else <laughs> like it's like <laughs> but it's, it's not true but I love the like black and white approach and there's so many line of cut artists especially who do really gorgeous work with just one layer and like a lot of meticulous carving to create like tonal variations and like textures and things like that and it's so gorgeous i i don't print with black like ever <laughs> it's a it's a weird thing i have um but yeah like none of my prints have black in them when and i was they only go to like mid gray even they don't they don't go into like 75 percent value or anything like this one it's very light very soft. When I was doing research for my talk, um, I was researching like litho and the reason that it kind of took off back in the day, like why it became so popular was the black ink was so black and they like couldn't, they yeah. couldn't wrap their heads around it, like how awesome that was. And I think that's where my black like obsession is coming from. From litho? <laughs> yeah. And like that jar of like black ink that's like just so tarry and like it's like the Sith, like blood, like it's so like, it's like so black. <laughs> oh man, yes. I also enjoy the like seven different kinds of black ink that you can get if you're like really feeling the nuances in different kinds of black. Those are fun. I had a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more to, cause I found this really interesting how like the importance of the distinction between book artist and publisher and like ah, what that means to you. Sure, I would be happy to. So to me, book artist means that I am first and foremost an artist 
And I am first and foremost, like a creative person who is trying to bring something unique to a project and that I'm an individual and that I have all of the capabilities of an individual. And the problem that I continue to run up against in publishing was that instead of your, instead of your like peers in the field being like other individuals, your peers in the field are penguins. Like <laughs> it's just, it's just so, there's such a huge range of what can be done. And there's so many roles wrapped up into publishing because publishing is broken down into so many different jobs. If you have like an actual, if you have like a, a press that like turns out, you know, more than 10 books a year, you know, you've got, you've got probably several editors. You've got somebody who's in charge of marketing or again, several somebody's in charge of marketing. You know, you have illustrators who are like on contract and you work with writers and there's a lot of like legal things involved um, that can be complicated for you to do as an individual. So as an individual, I, when I take on, actually I'll talk about this. When I take on a collaboration as an individual, because I have like a little bit of a financial buffer in my business, um, I pay for all of the like material supplies and the editing um, upfront. So the author doesn't have to pay anything when they collaborate with me. They bring their work to the table and they like work through the process of getting the book into a physical format with me, but they don't have to pay anything. Um, and then once we start selling the book, we first pay back all of those fees for like editing materials. And then we split the, the profits of the sales of the book 50, 50. So as an individual, that's like, it's professionally safe, but it also feels kind of generous, right? Like I'm the one who's putting myself at risk. If I was identifying as a publisher, it would be incredibly selfish of me not to offer my collaborator an advance. And I feel like that's a big difference between identifying as a publisher and identifying as a book artist. Does that help? Yeah, no, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. I had a question. Um, you talked about how um, you kind of like have this approach where you, every time you take on a project, it's like slightly more difficult and you have to figure it out. But I'm really impressed just because like, Thank you. for me, it's really hard to um, branch out past a specific comfort zone and also to like do something I have never done before. Like just even the, the last project you did where the book had to be soaked in the water. Mm -hmm. Like how do you even start tackling like that, an idea like that? Like, you know, so I wouldn't even know where to start first of all. I think, but, like, I think community considered. is really key for this element of experimentation. Because I'm a printmaker, uh, for anybody who is unfamiliar, you need a lot of equipment, you know? You, I mentioned that the press is expensive. You also need like a concrete floor to put the press on that's not gonna move. So like I can't have one in my home. Um, and, uh, and so there are these print communities, um, you know, there's, several of them across Canada and actually printmaking is even bigger in the United States and lino cut is like really big in the UK. And so in Canada, we've got Snap and Edmonton. Um, we have, there's a place in Winnipeg and a place in Vancouver whose names are escaping me right now. There's Open Studio in Toronto. There's Atelier Circular in Quebec. There is uh, St. Michael's Print Shop in Newfoundland. And all of these places have equipment and you would rent it like you would rent out. Um, it's the thing that non-artists rent out. Uh, like a storage <laughs> container. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so you rent it out. Like for example, uh, at Open Studio, if you, if you pay for your year up front, it costs a hundred dollars a month to access 24 seven. And that's incredibly affordable. That's like mind-blowing affordable. 
Um, so because we all congregate in these communities around the machinery, we also congregate in communities intellectually and with experimentation in different um, materials and processes. So especially for the, this last project that I worked on where you had to soak the book in order to wash away the letters and the images, um, this is a process that was experimented with and perfected, not in exactly the same application, by somebody at the studio, that, in Open Studio. Actually, her name is Agatha Derda. Um, I don't have access to the chat, but it's A-D-A-T-A -A -A underscore D-E-R-D-A on Instagram. And, and just, uh, what was it? Agatha, A-G-A-T-A -A underscore Derda, D-E-R-D-A. Like on that. Instagram. And, uh, and yeah, so she's been doing this thing where she makes a line of cut print and then she puts rice paste on top of it to block out certain areas and then she runs it through a digital printer and then she washes off the rice paste. So anything from the digital printer that got on areas that she didn't want it to get to was then removed and you could just like see clearly the line of cut part. And um, because I was able to be in the same space as her and like witness this process, that potential application sort of like lodged in my brain. And then when I was like, I want to make a book that collaborates with the water, I was like, oh, hey, <laughs> maybe this will work. I still definitely should have done more tests. Like it was, it was a thing. My partner who's also a printmaker is always like are you going to test that are you sure that's going to work and I'm like it's going to be fine it's always <laughs> a little complicated and I have lots of setbacks but I am the kind of person who likes to like just dive in and deal with the setbacks rather than like do a lot of careful planning beforehand and that's probably going to bite me in the butt someday it already has so let's be real <laughs> well you have nothing but like amazing projects to show for it so I think you're probably yeah. Thank you. does anyone else have any other questions in the chat i i was um i'm just like i'm just jogging my memory of what you said with just you, you see things and then they kind of like stick with you and then later on you like come across them and i was trying to get in contact with this company called like chromium i don't even know if they exist anymore but it's out of montreal and chromium covers on, on comic books in the 90s were like highly like the, the covers like looks like a bright like mirror basically like and all okay. the colors are super like metallic and embossed usually and they're called gimmick covers and like there there be like scratch and sniff covers there'd be chromium covers there's lenticular there and they're trying their printmaking was dying and they're trying to get people to buy like physical copies of comics and I was trying to get in contact with chromium and like and just because like it's you think of these things and then later on you want you like want to use them or like they they make a connection and like you want to be like oh I can use that for this or whatever but I don't know if you'd ever you do like save all of your links and your contact info and all of the things so you don't yeah. lose it <laughs> and it's like yeah if you ever did like a scratch and sniff book or whatever it is like it's oh there's God. all there's all these things that you can do with print that are and it seems like in the 90s, they were just like throwing everything at the wall and trying to make it stick, basically. It went, and it's like, well, it, it's, it's just dying. It's, it's like a different thing now. Like, mm -hmm. And then, you know, comic books became movies, basically, <laughs> like is what happened. Like, <laughs> no one cares about physical comics right now. Like, they do. Not like millions of copies being sold, but like they have like 15,000 copies being sold instead. Mm -hmm. And it, like, the numbers are totally different. But yeah. yeah, it's kind of funny that like we like printmakers like try to they, like they'll see something and then they'll like use it later and yeah, it's just kind of like cool. I don't know. It kind of made me think of my past and stuff like that. I actually get a lot of emails from companies like that that have like specialty printing services and they're like, "Do you need help printing your next project?" And I'm like, "I'm actually a printmaker, but thank you." Except I don't reply to them, so it's more in my mind. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, those companies definitely exist. And yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting the potential of things that you can do. But I've also enjoyed like including other physical elements in book projects. Um, like 
in one of my second second books or something that we did collaboratively um terry abrams a wish uh there's actually like a dried fall leaf in like the back flap of every copy um which was fun to do and what else there were stickers in one of the books i'm working on one right now that's like um an infinity unfold book where you like it, it, the structure is such that you like unfold it and then you turn it and you unfold it again, you turn it and you unfold it again, you turn it and you unfold it again, and then you're back on the first page. So it's like, it's like a forced meditation if your book only goes in loops, um, which is very different from how we like think about books as like having a start and a finish. I'm also um, one of those people who, if I don't know what an art is, I'm like, it's a book. Uh, is, it an, is it an installation that involves like sticks in a row? I'm like, that's a book. Is it, an insta is it like, oh man, I don't know. But I'm definitely prone to being like, that's a book to something that does not bear any resemblance to a book to anybody else. I guess it's just like the way you see it now, huh? Plus yeah. Different. Yeah. Uh, do you guys know that a friend of mine, actually, she, I think it might've been Brie Vermeer or I can't remember who said who who pointed me to like the little meme of like there's like an anime boy and he has like a blue butterfly in front of him and he's like is this a and then people fill in the blank <laughs> she's like you should make one for is this a book <laughs> I've yet to do it but it's on my to-do list <laughs> part of your practice yeah um this idea of like so, actually sorry is Zane is your question done I don't want to interrupt yeah, I was just, I don't know, just kind of mind spewing at Brianna. Cool. <laughs> that's um, conversation. It's been like a long time since I've talked to her, so it's exciting. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I just like, I like that you like push the bounds of whatever you're doing outside of what kind of the boundaries it exists in. And so I, I would love to hear more about like, I know sometimes the uh, person, the author will come to the, with an idea to you, but how do you kind of like think about pushing books outside these like boundaries that exist already? Sometimes I have like a very specific vision starting right out. Like I read the poetry and I'm like, ooh, this. And like for Evelyn's book, um, Conversations with the Ocean, I didn't so much picture the water soluble ink right away but I did picture the um, instabook format which if anybody's unfamiliar it's like when you take a sheet of paper I was going to demo this I still might <laughs> hang on let's just demo it it's like let's see I created this setup now you can see my table can you see my table yeah do you want to stop screen sharing just so we can ah. see the screen better Stop sharing. I forgot that I still was. Thank you for all of your patience, everybody. Of okay. Now, if I point this, you can kind of see my table. Yeah. I have a piece of paper here. So an Instabook is a format where you fold your paper in half and then you fold it in half again. And then you fold it in half again. And then you unfold it. Can you guys kind of see? I'm trying to aim. Yeah, we can see. And then you unfold it and you make a tear from like the folded edge. You make a tear to the center. Or you can cut. And then when you unfold it, I have like a whole blog post about how to do this. Oh, like a zine. That's yeah, awesome. but it's like a very specific format that I never heard the term Instabook until I moved to Edmonton. And then people were like, oh yeah, that's an Instabook. And I was like, great. That is such a fantastic term for it. Yeah. But you get like a little booklet out of one sheet of paper that has a front cover and then a second page and a third page and a back cover and there's no glue and there's no stitching 
And so I just envisioned this book where like it seemed like the whole thing was only text, but then if you like took apart the structure of the book, then you would find the image on the inside. I have this like long time concept that I haven't I haven't uh, implemented. I don't have like concrete plans to implement it, but of doing a section of like the secret garden where the images like are of a garden and it's like tucked inside a book where you can't actually open the page. You can only kind of like fold the page funny and like peer into it. You can't see it on its own like flat surface. We'll see. Awesome. <laughs> well, yeah, it's cool because you take like, like a, a, I guess like an aspect of it. It's like the secret garden and then you like make it a physical thing. Like Make it a physical secret. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, what else? Where do my ideas come from? Um, the first idea that came to me for Think of the Seams, this, this one. Yeah. Is the envelope. I had a Pinterest board and I had a button string envelope on it. And I was like, I need to make something with a button string envelope desperately. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so I oh. did. Where's this thought going? Oh, um, a button string envelope. One of the reasons I really love it is that it like dates back to World War One in the UK when everybody's mail was being searched. And so the only way to send mail that didn't like fall out of the envelope after like somebody opened to search it was in a resealable envelope. And that's why this format exists. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah. Would they be using like wax seals before that? And then, then they like designed the- uh... Or just like, even like a lick and stick envelope. When you open it, you cannot re reclose it. Right. I don't know if they had lick and stick in World War One times. It would probably would have been poisonous if- <laughs> You're right. It probably, they probably definitely had it and it was probably definitely poisonous. There's the Seinfeld episode where George's wife actually dies licking the envelopes uh, for the wedding because the, he's so cheap that he bought the cheap uh, envelopes for oh, the wedding. Oh no. And she's like licking them all episode and she starts getting all woozy and just kind of like passes out and then she dies. <laughs> Oh my it's a god. Hard punchline for a joke. Look at wow. it. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah. That's like a whole that's like one of your stories. Like you could probably make that into one of your stories and like have her like getting sicker and sicker throughout the book and then <laughs> you have to lick the pay uh, whatever it would be. I'm sure you could mm -hmm. next you you could have to <laughs> <laughs> Well the thing is I don't actually write any of the stories and that's pretty key to my practice is I I, I did a few books, you know, when I was a student where I wrote little short stories and, um, and then, you know, illustrated them and made them into little books. And I go back and I look at them and I'm like, oh, cool structure, nice illustrations, cringy story. Like, <laughs> like 22 year old Brianna, why, why did you write about this? Okay, I guess. Um, you know your own strengths, I guess. Like somebody else should do the writing and somebody else should yeah. do the binding and all. Yeah. Yeah. You're only one. I, person, so. I've often used this um, explanation to talk about why I do collaborations. Is that like by myself, I can do something that's like this good. And my collaborator can do something that's this good. And together we can make something that's this good. <laughs> Maybe. Which is hard to do if you can't like show your hands. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally right. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. And collaboration can be like, um, it can be a complicated thing to undertake. Um, you know, uh, when do you when do you formalize a collaboration? Like I use contracts for everybody now that I work with, just because you know, I've had projects fall apart and that, uh, that's always a really big disappointment. And so I, you know, I try and plan for, you know, worst case scenarios in my contracts, but sometimes, you know, you're, you're like just working with a friend on a project, like, do you formalize that? It's, it's a really hard line. 
um, and not hard line, I mean soft line, complicated, difficult to find line <laughs> um, with, with collaborations and especially long-term collaborations. Like I, I work with people on two-year contracts, which feels like a long time since I'm 28 and felt like a really long time when I was you know, 25. Um, but it's, it's a, a short enough time period that if I decide that I want to change direction, then I know that I, I can like be fully in a different lane in two years, as opposed to like having a longer contract, like a five-year contract where I'm locking myself in until I'm 33. That seems crazy. I don't know what I'm going to be doing when I'm 33. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, I think that the contracts are important um, under any scenario if you can. I've heard it said, like, even if you're working with your friends or family, mm -hmm. because it's like, at the end of the day, a lot of, like, a lot, if not all the labor is yours. And so your, mm -hmm. your time is valuable too. Yeah. One of the, <laughs> for my last project, I mentioned that we had like collaborators on all of the coast and near the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes collaborator is actually my brother and we did not have a contract and like in the middle of the project I was like oh is this a good idea and then at the end of the project he had like such a fantastic job and I was like <laughs> like that's not the kind of thing that you want to like have to deal with like in a family situation um but yeah yeah it's tricky tricky and like again with my my partner who is listening hi Alex um you know we we have often talked about like what would we collaborate on would we do a project together and it's always like maybe maybe it's just not we already have like so much overlap by being professional printmakers that like maybe we don't do a collaboration or maybe we wait a few more years <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure so we're at an hour does anyone have okay. any other questions I just want to make sure before um, and then if not, you can go ahead and wh whatever you were about to say. Uh, I don't know if I was about to say anything. Oh, oh. I had one, I had one, uh, like finishing off piece of advice for artists. If anybody here is I'm sure some people are artists here. Yeah, definitely a couple. Um, <laughs> talk to people about your art. Um, I was in conversation with somebody a couple days ago in this, um, in this like mentorship group that I'm in. And she was talking about how she makes great art when she's like in a vacuum and it's just her and it's just what she wants to make. But like, if she even thinks about anyone else's opinion, she ends up making something that she hates. And she just, she feels like she just needs to like tuck away in her studio and make work and not listen to anybody's feedback. And my approach has been like very different, but with the same end goal and that is talk to as many people as possible about what you're working on and you'll get so many different kinds of feedback and opinions and the more opinions you have the less each individual opinion matters and the more like you could just take on what you know is right to create and plus when you talk to people about your art you get new and interesting opportunities and and just I talked about the fact that I was like quitting my job to start a full-time art practice with the bus driver on my way home from work yesterday. And he's not even my regular bus driver. <laughs> he was just like, do you work at that framing place? And I was like, yep, not for long. And then we started chatting. And that's the way that I am everywhere. And I have met some very cool people, you know, just, just, you know, being very transparent about what it is that I'm working on and what what I want it to do, where I want it to go. Um, yeah, so that would be my number one, number one piece of advice for all emerging artists. That's awesome. <laughs> Good advice. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think you uh, stand to learn a lot from just talking about your own practice. Yeah, plus when you, when, when you get in a situation like this, where you're like, talk about your practice for an hour, <laughs> uh, you have things to say and you know what words that you like to use because you've used lots of different words and you've found the good ones. Totally. Yeah, you see their facial uh, expressions and all of that stuff and you can tell if they're confused or if they don't like it. Or <laughs> I, like, I like that you're saying this from behind a, like a profile picture and not from a video screen. 
<laughs> what facial expression? <laughs> uh, it's awesome. a it's a consistent grin. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you. Um, really, thank everybody for for coming. It's it's been uh, it's been fun. Awesome. Um, yeah. Well, we want to thank you. Good Sport wants to thank you for taking time out to do this. Uh, we will be putting the recording up on our YouTube channel hopefully soon. Um, and you can see everyone's talks from before that should be on there as well. Um, you can still access um, Raina's profile uh, from our Instagram. So if anyone wants to go check out her work um, and then, yeah, tune in for the next one. It'll be next month. It'll be Joanna who's in here in this call right now. Mm -hmm. So we're pumped. Thanks so much, Raina. And so thanks so much. Everyone. Oh, thank you so much for having me here. It's awesome. And my, I feel I, my, I was feeling like a little bit of an imposter Londoner at the beginning, but no, I feel good. No, officially proving yourself. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, have a really good evening. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>